Hi there everyone, welcome to our first video, oops, excuse me, for week two, uh, where we're going to be discussing Descartes' meditations. Uh, now this is the first major thing that we're reading in this class. We're going to go through the whole book. Uh, we're going to discuss all of its major sections, as well as the motivations that Descartes had for writing it. And in the subsequent weeks, we're going to discuss the reception of Descartes' work. Descartes was an enormously influential thinker. When you go, you know, to this point in history, a lot of the really great figures are sort of polymaths, right? They're, um, you know, just incredible in multiple different occupations or disciplines and Descartes certainly exemplifies that in a whole lot of ways. I mean, he was an extremely distinguished mathematician as well as being, you know, world historical philosopher, right? And we're going to ultimately see that these two dimensions of Descartes' work are integrally interrelated to one another. And we're going to try to explore the implications of Descartes' grand new vision for the role of philosophy in a modern world. I would venture to claim that we have not essentially moved beyond the situation or the confines or the philosophical problems that Descartes deals with in the meditations, even if his concepts need to be radically altered or reconfigured or adjusted in some way. Descartes, in many ways, simply speaks all of the language that we have developed in a certain way orients itself around Descartes' work. Our own self-understanding is oftentimes unconsciously Cartesian, whether we know it or not. And that's what makes this work so central and so paramount to the history of philosophy. And so that is why we're going to spend so many weeks, you know, making sure that we have a good grasp on these ideas. Because the better grasp that we have over Descartes and the more time that you spend on this week's readings in particular, the easier the entire rest of the course is very likely to be. You know, as I mentioned, just because um, many of the philosophers that we're going to be discussing echo Descartes' thinking, or at least use Descartes' thinking as a jumping off point for their own ideas, understanding Descartes, situating yourself in Descartes' work uh, will definitely help you a lot in this course. Another thing is that this work, the meditations, is really nice. It's really nice because it is the central, the paramount philosophical text for Descartes' Avoir. He thought it was the most important, it was the most rigorously philosophical, right? And it's relatively short and self-contained. If we were to read, he also disseminated this document around the time it was going to be published to a number of philosophers, among them figures like uh, Thomas Hobbes, who you may have heard of, who's sort of like an empiricist, materialist philosopher. And along with, you know, everything that we're going to be reading together, Descartes also published um, the objections in his replies. And so sort of built into the meditation is its own reception history. So that's really why understanding the meditations is absolutely central for our endeavor in this class, which is to learn early modern um, philosophy. Now I'm gonna go through the board so that we can sort of get an introduction to Descartes' thinking and the central problems that motivated uh, his philosophical endeavors. So at the very top here, I have Descartes' Meditations. And then in this first column, the first thing I have written is Important Context, Copernicus, and Galileo. 
We discussed this somewhat briefly in the last um, lecture, but I think it is very important to emphasize just how important the Copernican Revolution was, right? The Copernican Revolution involved a complete reconceptualization of our picture of the galaxy, human beings placed within it, the appropriate tools and resources to understand that order, right? Copernicus is able to discover, you know, the kind of displacement, right, of uh, our position in the universe through the fact, through the, it, the, you know, orbits of the various planets, right? And so there's this idea that you can use mathematical tools to understand in sort of speak the language of the universe and that this method does not require the sort of theological insight uh, that you know the church and various others and uh, various other kind of institutions insisted upon and galileo took this revolution even further through you know, even greater scientific discoveries, even more claims on the part of science that certain religious doctrines were incorrect, poorly thought through, had no evidentiary basis, and so on. And so Descartes, in, you know, when it, he's conceiving of the project of the meditations, he's seeing the Inquisition of Galileo. And he's seeing the fundamental conflict between the claims made from religious authorities on the one hand and the irrefutable uh, discoveries of modern science on the other. And so Descartes' position is sort of like, well, what do you do? about that, right? If you're, you're a philosopher, you want to understand the meaning of that kind of situation. And Descartes' ideas are often based on just a few kind of insights that I think most of you will agree with. And so I have written here Cartesian insights, and in the first bullet point I have some of our beliefs are false. This is the shock that Descartes experienced through um, the Copernican Revolution, but also, you know, various other cases where, you know, he was a scientific investigator, he wanted to know about the nature of the world, much of that knowledge at the time was passed on by mere hearsay, there is nothing like a scientific method in place to determine what counts as like a scientific proposition about something or a not scientific proposition about something. And so this just leaves Descartes in the position of recognizing, you know, a, gr a very great many of our beliefs are false and unjustified. Now, that becomes a problem because of the second insight, which is that beliefs are inferential. So that might sound like, a, a, I don't know, uh, an SAT word or whatever, but it's really quite easy. So, you know, inference means that, you know, you can infer from one thing to another. To, so to say that beliefs are inferential is to say that from one belief, you can gain other beliefs, or that certain beliefs speak in favor of others. So, you know, if I'm going to be late to the ball game and someone else is going to be early, you can infer from that that they will be there before me, right? It's not possible for both of those things to be true and for me to show up first. Right? You can try to do linguistic shenanigans, but if you keep the, the proposition saying what they say, then it's, you can always infer that I will be, or, you know, that the person coming earlier will be there first, right? So the point is just that beliefs speak in favor of other beliefs. Beliefs are in a context or a web where they relate to other sort of beliefs. 
If you believe that there's a soul, then you probably believe that there's an afterlife because it makes sense for you to think that there's some place for the souls to go. And so this is what makes for Descartes the existence of false beliefs really troubling. It would be no great hassle if we had some beliefs that were false, but that they were like idle, right? That they didn't produce more false beliefs. But, you know, Descartes, you know, one of Descartes' discoveries is how inferential beliefs are, how much beliefs depend on other beliefs. And so if we have sort of sifted in to our go or whatever, a bunch of false beliefs, it will spoil, right, our whole structure because our structure is based around parts that are false. And that's what Descartes thinks Copernicus ultimately discovered is that C Copernicus was able to somehow undermine an incredibly central belief that we had as part of this web, which is that human beings are a reflection of God and a reflection of God's goodness and so belong at the center of the inverse. And along with that belief, if we overturn that belief, then that requires overturning all of the beliefs that are inferences from it. And so that means a radical revisioning of everything that we know about the world. Okay, and so I have written here, but also some of our beliefs are true, right? This is important. If we were in the situation where we had no reliable way of getting from one belief to another belief, then the whole feasibility of human knowledge would be wrong. You wouldn't be able to infer anything from anything, right? It's only because some things are true in our language that any of the inferences make sense at all, right? And this is just obvious. There have to be some things that we think that are true because we can think like the opposite of something that's false, right? So Descartes says, at least some of our beliefs are true and at least some of those inferences are good and they are always good, right? Uh, an example of that Descartes would say are mathematical inferences, right? So you can always infer that a triangle, you know, an enclosed triangle on, you know, a plane has 180 degrees, it has three sides, it has three angles, right? You're able to infer a bunch of information simply from the definition or the essence of what a triangle is. And so there's at least some domain, especially Descartes is influenced by mathematics, where it seems like we can generate beliefs that are true and that are reliable and where the inferences work, right? Two plus two equals four does not depend on your language. It doesn't depend on your life experience. It doesn't become true whenever you learn it. It was already true, right? And that is the structure of mathematical truth. And Descartes, as a mathematician, is very inspired by this idea. Descartes is very interested in the idea that when you're doing mathematics, you know, aside from certain kinds of errors like calculation errors and so on, that you can ensure the validity of your conclusion simply from the form that it's given, right? And so essentially, you know, what Descartes then thinks is like this. Okay, well, if we have some sources of knowledge that are false, right? Or sources of belief that end up being false, but we also know that there is a sure proof method that is at least used in mathematics and Descartes ultimately extends it into geometry by inventing analytic geometry, which is sort of the, al the application of uh, algebra to geometry, right? You remember the Cartesian coordinate plane with an x-y axis, 
uh, that was developed by Descartes. And it was developed by Descartes because Descartes believed that geometry has the same level of proof uh, of certainty and so on as algebra and arithmetic and other aspects of mathematics. And Descartes' idea was like, well, let's just apply you know, a algebra, functions, etc., to geometry. And that was the basis for his idea, right? And it works, and it's an amazing invention, and it has changed all of our lives because presumably when we went through grade school, we learned about certain kinds of Cartesian ideas, that we can apply the methods of mathematics to space. That is a profoundly Cartesian idea. And so to move now to this middle column, let's talk about the great philosophical Cartesian idea. And the great Cartesian idea in philosophy is to discover a method for philosophy to preserve the truth of its entrances from an absolute starting point. And in later videos, we're going to learn that Descartes' name for this starting point is the cogito. It's okay if you don't know what that is for right now. Um, we're going to discuss it in more depth in a later video for today. So this is his idea, and I mentioned at the very bottom actually of this left column to mention the reguli. This was a text that Descartes wrote um, before the meditations, where he didn't really have a method for discovering truth yet, but he did feel like he had some indications of like when beliefs were false. And so he tried to write out like little rules, like, you know, if something, if a belief relies entirely on hearsay, it's probably false, right? Um, and so what happens in the meditations is that Descartes thinks that he can use the, the same methods that he used to make his mathematical discoveries and apply them to the philosophical domain and have a, philo a philosophy that had the same level of certainty and rigor as mathematics. And so before he didn't have a method for truth, he had a method for avoiding falsehood. But now with analytic geometry, with his own ideas about uh, mathematical method, Descartes now has a method in the meditations for philosophy to discover the absolute truths that follow from the first primordial truth. And so in the same way that if you were to read like Euclid's Elements, Euclid was an uh, ancient mathematician who wrote sort of like the most important book of geometry. And many of these figures sort of turn to that for like, hey, here's what a robust systematic method looks like. Euclid began with certain sort of axioms that he took to be self-evident and then uh, drew out the implications of those axioms. Similarly, Descartes thinks that he can discover something that has evidence that is so strong that it has a kind of self-evidence that's not evident in virtue of some other thing, but is through its nature entirely self-evident. And that this self-evident beginning forms the, uh, forms the starting point for a philosophical investigation. We're going to talk more about the specifics of this method, specifically methodological skepticism, in our next video. What's important for now is that you just understand the motivation for like why you would attempt to discover a method for philosophy in this way. Now, so for the third column, dualism and this is a very Cartesian idea that there are two fundamental kinds of things in the universe. We can't talk about that now, but we'll talk about it in more depth in a later video. And just like there are two kinds of things, there's two kinds of knowledge, right? There's true inference, inferences that have the structure of mathematics, and there are false ones that have the structure of imagination or illusion. So dualism is already on the scene in this way. 
put in Thancard's dedicatory letter to the Sorbonne. So that's the first um, piece, first chapter, first section in uh, your meditations. Descartes makes clear that part of his goal, at least, is to preserve the reality of the soul. Namely, he thinks that the existence of the soul, the existence of some kind of thinking substance, is that absolute foundation. And it is that absolute foundation because we are that thing. We are a thinking substance. We are a cogito. And so the evidence that we draw is not from some external thing, but from ourselves. And so this is going to outline the basic structure for the rest of the meditations. The next couple of videos are going to be close readings, first of meditations one and two, and then meditations three through six. I hope this is helpful for you all. Thanks. Bye.